at 5 a.m. on September 14, 2002, in Tangshan town in the former capital city of Nanjing, a person was brought into one of the town's hospitals, suffering agonizing stomach cramps. What doctors suspected was a case of severe food poisoning, soon took a deadly turn when the patient began to violently convulse, foam at the mouth, and bleed from their nose before vomiting copious amounts of blood. The patient passed away before doctors could properly diagnose the symptoms. As the medical team tried to find the cause of the patient's sudden and painful death, in another area of the town, the four young cousins of one of the residents developed the same symptoms. Stomach pain, convulsions, bleeding from the nose, foaming at the mouth, and vomiting blood. Not long after the onset of symptoms the four children were dead. Shortly after 6 a.m. the manager of a commissary at the gates of Tangshan Zhuochang Middle School heard screams and shouting coming from the campus. Entering the canteen they saw around 30 of the students writhing on the floor in agony, bleeding from their noses and mouths. Around an hour later, another commissary manager, this time at a construction site for what is now a residential and commercial complex, witnessed workers clutching their stomachs, falling to the ground in agony, before convulsing and foaming at the mouth. Calls to the emergency services flooded switchboards, all reporting the same thing. People all over the town suddenly developing the same symptoms, falling gravely ill and in many cases passing away shortly after the onset of symptoms. The police and paramedics quickly became overwhelmed by the large number of patients they had to deal with. Beds in all the town's hospitals quickly filled up. The military were called in to help but it still wasn't enough. Anyone who had a vehicle that was able to carry people started to assist. Taxis, people with private cars, even rickshaws were transporting the stricken to medical centers. The suspicion with the early patients that the symptoms were down to severe food poisoning had long since been dismissed. This was clearly something much worse. In fears that the town's reservoir had somehow been contaminated, the water supply to homes and businesses was shut off. Doctors in the various medical centers didn't have the time nor the equipment necessary to do tests which could identify the cause of the outbreak. They had to find the most effective way to treat the case of blind, to save as many people as they could. From police interviews a common factor emerged. Both the managers and the middle school and construction site commissaries had bought food from the same place. More people who were with those who developed symptoms all told police they had consumed items from the same business. Word had already spread through the town that people were falling ill and dying after eating breakfast. Anger and panic spread as quickly as the rumors. Residents went to businesses selling breakfast food, shouting warnings to people who were still unaware of the crisis to not eat the products. One vendor in an effort to quell the crowd tried to show that what they were selling was safe. They quickly consumed a pancake in front of gathered onlookers. Within moments of eating, the vendor began feeling the stomach pains and vomiting blood on the sidewalk. Investigators made their way to Zongwu Noodle Shop, the place where many people who'd fallen ill had consumed or purchased products. The small local business run by Chen Zhu was located in a farmer's market, with several other businesses selling the same or similar type of food. The Zhu noodle shop was a popular and successful small family-run business. It had a reputation in the town for selling good quality, tasty, freshly made products. It sold to individual customers, as well as wholesale to schools, businesses and other stores in the town. Despite being called a noodle shop it focused more on other foods. It was known for popular fried or baked breakfast snacks such as scallion or sesame pancakes, fried dough sticks and sesame dough balls, and other pastries, all made on site. Investigators tested the store's ingredients and found a toxic substance in the flour, salt, oil and sugar used to make the snacks. Chen Zongwu and his eight employees were arrested and taken in for questioning. The whole area was shut down as tests were done to see if any stores had contaminated ingredients. The toxic chemical found in the ingredients was identified as tetramethylene disulfotetramine, or TETS for short. A strong neurotoxin that was used in rat poisons, but due to its toxicity, especially to mammals, its use has largely been banned. It is significantly more toxic than other potentially lethal chemicals, potassium cyanide and arsenic, and has no known antidote. The poison can eventually lead to organ failure. But the biggest issue facing the doctors in Nanjing was being able to incubate the patients while they were suffering convulsions, leaving many victims unable to breathe. Patients were treated with IVs of benzodiazepine and pyridoxine to get the seizures under control. The first 20 patients arriving at medical facilities had all passed away, but doctors started to win the battle against the toxin. 
Police interviewing the owner of the store at the center of the incident, Chen Zongwu, could find no motive for him to deliberately taint his own products. His business was doing very well, and he had a long established reputation for quality in the area. There was no logical reason why he'd want to damage his own business. There was also no reason found for any of his employees to tamper with the ingredients. The possibility that the contamination happened accidentally seemed equally unlikely. Police couldn't find any poison on the premises, except for that which contaminated the food. Large amounts of the chemical were found in different ingredients, something that gave the impression that someone wanted to make sure as many products as possible were poisoned. It was much more reasonable to believe that someone had decided to deliberately sabotage the business. With Zhongwu Noodle Store being much more popular than all the other similar stores in the area, there were plenty of potential suspects. Police interviewed the other store owners at the market except for one. One vendor couldn't be found. The owner of a rival store adjacent to Zhongwu Noodle's shop, Chen Zhengping. Police went to look for Chen Zhengping at the small apartment he was renting, but were told by the landlord of the building that the man they wanted left town earlier that morning. According to the landlord, the noodle vendor had stood by the door of the building watching the chaos erupt around the town, telling his landlord that it looked like there wouldn't be much business for a few days, so he was going to head back to his hometown. The landlord described Chen Zhengping as a good tenant. He always paid his rent and utility bills on time, and seemed to be a hard worker, running his noodle store with a young cousin. Checking out the landlord's story, police called the family of Chen Zhengping in the town of Pukou which wasn't far from Pangshan. However, the family told police that they hadn't seen or heard from their relative. Further investigation showed that the missing noodle vendor had boarded a train going in the opposite direction, heading toward Shanghai some 300 kilometers away, and had cleared out money from his bank accounts. Police now consider Chen Zhengping very much as a person of interest in connection to the poisoning. As the panic in the town began to subside and hospital admissions stopped, numbers began to come out. In the early reports the figures varied from between 600 and 400 people being poisoned and somewhere between 40 and 60 deaths, some of those occurring before victims could get to a medical center. Transport police alerted train stations and railway staff on the route Chen Zhengping was taking to be on the lookout for him. They disseminated the man's identity number and photos of the person to be on the lookout for. On receiving the alert one train conductor, Guo Ximei, decided she didn't want to be responsible for the person of interest to escape under her watch. She organized a search of the train, going through each carriage checking the passengers one by one under the guise of ticket inspections. At 4.50 in the morning on September 16th, she entered a sleeper carriage with one of the train's police officers. The lone man in the carriage was sleeping. He was gently woken and asked to present his ticket. On seeing the passenger's face, the officer immediately recognized him as the suspect they wanted and quickly subdued him. At the next stop, Chen Zhengping was handed over to other officers and transported back to Nanjing to be questioned in connection to the mass poisoning in Pangshan. At first he denied having anything to do with what happened that morning. When he was asked why he was on the train heading to Shanghai, his excuse was that he was impotent, and because of this he'd been unable to find a wife. He was going to see a doctor to help him with his erectile dysfunction. The police had already taken his clothes and clippings of his fingernails to be tested for the toxin. When the results came back with traces of it on the clippings and in the pockets of his trousers, he had no other option left but to confess. A native of Nanjing, he was 31 at the time of his arrest. After leaving school he worked as an apprentice in a snack bar for a couple of years before returning to farm in his hometown of Pukou. 25 kilometers from the city center. In 1990 he was arrested for stealing cigarettes and received a prison sentence. After his release in 1995, he made efforts to turn his life around and moved to Pangshan. He opened a breakfast food shop selling his own freshly made goods. He tended to sell noodles, meat pancakes and dumplings, and did decent business most of the time. Enough to give him a solid living, good enough to also take on his young cousin as an employee. The shop he ran was in the same farmer's market as Chen Zongwu, and the two men became friends. In early reports it was claimed that the two men were related as they shared the same family name, but it was later shown to be inaccurate. The relationship between the two men was such that the storefront that Chen Zhengping was using for his business was actually sublet to him by Chen Zongwu. Their respective businesses didn't directly conflict with each, as both focused on different foods. 
as far as anyone knew, the two men had a good friendly relationship, often playing cards together. There were occasionally words spoken over particularly competitive games but nothing too harsh or over the top. However, over time Chen Zhengping grew jealous of his friend's success. And then the increased every time he looked towards the steady stream of customers Chen Zongwu received, while he was only getting a fraction of that level of patronage. Things seemed to come to a head after a game of cards, Chen Zhengping lost some money to the man he was now considering a business rival and didn't take it well. The next morning he took a train to a place he knew sold the illegal rat poison. He bought 12 sticks and two 50 mg bottles of the toxic substance for only 8 RMB, which would be around $1.10 in today's money. Before putting his plan into action he tried the poison first. He wanted to see if the toxin could be tasted when mixed into the ingredients. He added trace amounts to his own recipes and sold them to customers. People ate the food without noticing anything strange. There is no information about what happened to his unsuspecting guinea pigs after consuming the tainted breakfast snack. But since there was no reaction from the local community, if people did suffer any symptoms they were light enough to be considered food poisoning. Satisfied that the poison wasn't noticeable, on the night of September 13th he entered Zongwu breakfast shop. He knew that Chen Zongwu usually started work at 4 in the morning, as did many others living and working in the farmer's market. There was little chance he was going to be interrupted by anyone as the other shop owners slept. Most of the businesses in the area were long established, and the owners all knew each other. That meant security wasn't a major concern. The stores didn't worry about having surveillance cameras, and windows were often left unlocked, if not fully open. Once inside, Chen Zhengping mixed the poison into as many ingredients as he could, ensuring that most of, if not all of the breakfast snacks would be contaminated. He used up all the poison he'd purchased and returned home. The landlord of his building remembered him returning at around 10.30 and didn't notice anything unusual about him. Early the next morning, Chen Zongwu and his staff got to work as usual, unsuspectingly preparing the now lethal breakfast snacks. Only hours later, tens of people were dead and hundreds seriously ill in hospital. The final official figures claimed that 44 people passed away from the poisoning and over 300 were hospitalized. On the 30th of September 2002, Chen Zhengping faced trial. His charge was releasing dangerous substances. He was found guilty and sentenced to death. He went on to appeal the sentence. His defense was that he didn't think people would die. His intent was only to harm his former friend's business so his own would make more money. He argued that the sentence was too harsh and that it was unjust. The court disagreed. They upheld the original sentence and the death penalty stood. On October 14th, just a month after the mass poisoning of Tang Shan, Chen Zhengping was executed. The actions of Chen Zhengping were felt by many long after the incident. Those fortunate to survive being poisoned, suffered numerous health problems years after recovering. Once people knew the truth, the reputation of Zongwu noodle shop wasn't hurt too badly. Chen Zongwu continued with his business, and as of April 2023, his shop was still open and still a popular spot for the locals breakfast. While already illegal in the country, much harsher sentences would be handed out for people selling tats in the future. This wasn't the first time the toxin had been used in a mass poisoning, and unfortunately it wouldn't be the last. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please consider giving it a like, leaving a comment, and subscribing to the channel. And hope to see you again for the next Dark Tale from the Middle Kingdom.